Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Uh, we have some follow-up. Oh, do we? Yeah, we've got some follow-up on Murder by Death. Friend of the show, uh, Alicia Warfield, writes, If Murder by Death is no good for anything but a send-up, what about Hitchcock's family plot or Mel Brooks' high anxiety? Are they all destined for Hollywood's compost heap? So my question for you, Andy, is do you remember your position on uh, on this one, or do you uh, do you want to flag it? I Well, I remember feeling like it was, it was uh, fair to Midland. Yeah. I, I didn't think it was anything super special. I'd rather watch Clue over Murder by Death. Uh, you know, it just... 
the, it, it felt very stagey. But yeah. what about your what about comparison to these other two films, Family Plot and High Anxiety? Well, Family Plot is uh, definitely a, a stranger Hitchcock film. Um, I don't know. I just uh, I, I don't think I, I I don't know. I don't know if fa- Family Plot was intentionally supposed to be goofy, was it? <laughs> <laughs> or was it just Hitchcock making a bad film? I, you know, I, I, I'm really actually relieved to hear you say that because it's definitely not one of my favorite films of Hitchcock. It's oh no, he deteriorated. His quality yeah. definitely kind of slipped toward his yeah. toward the end there. And, and Family this... Plot, I think, is is his biggest slip. Yeah, it's it it really is. So I, you know, when you say about Family Plot, plot is this one destined for the compost heap? It's uh, to me, it's at the bottom of the compost heap. Like it's already there. It's yeah. food for worms. Uh, what about High Anxiety, though? I've never actually seen it, so I I can't speak to that because I don't know. Uh, I mean, but it's Mel Brooks, so it's like I don't know. It, it uh, I don't know. I don't know enough about it to put it in context of his other films, I guess. Yeah, I well, I I think I, you know Mel Brooks is it's one of those where I I know what I'm going to get with Mel Brooks you know I I know exactly what I'm going to get I um I find Madeline Kahn and Cloris Leachman and I just the the Mel Brooks cast I find them funny just they could just sit there and not do anything but give them even a modest script I'm likely going to laugh my memory of High Anxiety it's it's not up there with like History of the World uh, Part One. Uh, Spaceballs, uh, space Well, it might be up there with Spaceballs. I or it, it might hey, be now. in there with Spaceballs. Uh, but I, History of the World Part One is like is is just a is a tremendous feat for me. I love that film. Uh, so I, I would not put. I would actually uh, here's. I would say High Anxiety is better than Murder by Death. But I okay. still love Murder by Death for just different reasons. I love it because of the connection I have with it as a kid, and and but it it didn't hold up on on last viewing. I think that's where we came out. Yes, I agree. But I appreciate the comparison uh, from Leisha, and I think that it's interesting that she brought up Family Plot. And I'm curious, Leisha, when you hear this, uh, comment on the blog or Facebook and let us know: Are you serious about Family Plot? Because that seemed like a joke. <laughs> we love did she you. write that yes we, did she write that yesterday <laughs> she wrote that just yesterday we love you Leisha. thank uh, you for for listening as always uh, <laughs> are we uh, are we good can we tell the people where we're from where are we from the next reel everybody i'm pete wright that over there is andy nelson hi ho and we spoil movies tonight on the show the the uh what is this the third fourth third this is the third the third in our 2015 film noir series with a controversial 1945 fritz lang hollywood noir scarlet street before we get to that though you should learn more about us at the follow us on twitter and facebook at the next reel and if you know what it's like to stand up for a woman to protect her honor in the dead of night from a malevolent stranger in 1945, then you might be ready to head over to Instagram.com slash the next reel and play the next reel's Instagram hashtag pony prize hashtag guess the movie challenge. Andy, how do we do against our pilloried pals this week? Wow. <laughs> Listen to you. This was, you know, Stephen Smart. Uh, I, I'd like to say that he uh, really pulled one out of the woodwork and, uh, and, and uh, and really stumped the people, uh, but it was it was a trick of a movie because it was a film that has seems to have been released in most countries around the world, but oddly hasn't been released yet in the U.S. And uh, so I think a lot of people just had no clue what the movie was. Um, it was the young and prodigious T.S. Spivet, which if you don't recognize the title, that's like I said, it hasn't been released in the U.S. But if you're in other parts of the world, maybe you have heard of it. You just aren't playing along on our Instagram Guess the Movie uh, Challenge. And uh, it it ran the full week, and nobody get got it. And so, uh, yeah, so this racks up oh, the oh, third oh. time that we managed to stump people for a full week. First time was uh, what was the first time? It I was, don't uh, remember the first two. I did. I thought this was the first time we'd done this before. Yeah, we've stumped people twice. The first time was um, I'm blanking now. Well, anyway, I, I know that. Um, that Stephen posted what they were uh, over on uh, on I on Instagram. I'm looking at Instagram, trying to see where he posted it because I can't remember now. But yeah, we did uh, do it twice. Oh, he did it once with uh, Spione or Spies, 
the uh, silent Fritz Lang film, and then the time before that, um, it was uh, it was Ingmar Bergman, and I'm blanking on the t- title of the film. Huh. It would be Bergman. It yes. Be. All right. Um, well, I am uh, I'm very excited about uh, that win. Does that mean what does he what what does he enter to win? <laughs> he gets a pat on the back. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think it's time, Andrew. Let's do those trailers. I think I should go first. All right. It's only fitting, right? (laughs) All right. You go right ahead. The trailer that I'm doing is actually for the young and prodigious T.S. Spivet. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which I thought, considering Not, no one, no one has to find a point on it. That's right. Considering no one in the U.S. has ever heard of that film, I thought that we should look at the trailer for it. This is it's an interesting. I mean, it, it's a great looking film. First of all, it's uh, it's by uh, Jean Pierre Junet, who uh, we talked about recently on the show with Delicatessen. And um, this is a it's an English language film. It was shot in the States. It looks like something that should have been released here. It came out like 2013 is when it started getting released in other parts of the world. But there's I guess there is a little bit of infighting going on between uh, Jean-Pierre Junet and the Weinsteins, who um, I think particularly Harvey, um, who they have the distribution rights for this film. And while they have said they are going to release it in the U.S., they seem to be kind of playing, uh, you know, playing games with it a little bit and just kind of um, dismissing Junet over this whole thing. And it seems like there's a little battle going on because he said that the reason that Amelie, um, which is an absolutely fantastic film, didn't win any Oscars was because of Weinstein. They had released, or Miramax had released Amelie in the U.S. back uh, when it came out. And it was nominated for five Oscars, but because this was that point when, you know, you remember with the Oscars and everybody getting on Weinstein's case, how he was buying, uh, basically buying the Oscars for people and stuff, you know, when things like, um, uh, you know, the, what's that, uh, that crazy uh, Italian actor who oh, won yeah, for Best well, beautiful, Actor? It's a beautiful, uh, li- or beautiful life. Uh, uh, yeah, what's his? Yeah, uh, yeah it's, a, it's a, right. And, uh, but he won for Best Actor and Roberto Benigni. Roberto Benigni. Yeah. Benigni. I love everybody. I love, you. I love, I love everybody. You. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> um, which was very fun to watch. But people were saying, oh, come on, that's not serious. And same with Shakespeare in Love. It's like he's buying these Oscars uh, for these people. And this was right at the downfall of all of that. And, and he said that, uh, Junet said that because of all the, um, the, the uh, you know, people getting irritated with Weinstein, nobody voted for Amelie. And, uh, and so I don't know if that's created a bit of a, a tumult in their relationship. But because of that, this film, it just doesn't seem like it's been released over here, even though they promised or they said that it's likely to get released sometime this summer. It looks so good. It does. It, it looks, looks crazy really good. good. Yeah, and it's it's disappointing that it hasn't been released. This is a story about this this young kid who uh, he's he's only ten, and he invents something that wins him an award at, in Washington D.C. And his his parents are very quirky. His dad's a cowboy. His mom looks like kind of a uh, you know a, what's a bug bug collector called? I can't remember. But anyway, so he's got a, a scientist. She loves collecting bugs and studying insects, and. Um, he, he's got this very quirky family, but he kind of sneaks out in the middle of the night to go on this journey across the country from like Montana to uh, to D.C. in order to collect his prize. And it just looks really quirky, very sweet. It looks like a wonderful children's film, like a family film. And I just can't believe it hasn't been uh, released. And I can't believe it's going through this uh, ridiculous uh, uh, problem that it's having. Entomologist. Entomologist. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to cut that in and just pretend like I knew what that meant the whole time. You're so smart. <laughs> well, I agree with you. I think it looks really, really good. And, uh, you know, it's it has that it has a strange sort of Jean-Pierre Genet feel to it, um, but uh, not as weird as Delicatessen. Really sweet. It just looks sweet. Exactly. I'm it doesn't sweet. really looking forward to it, and I hope they figure it out. I do, too. When, it's, uh, so we don't... It's releasing we don't, 
It's releasing in Sweden on April 3rd. By the time people are listening to this show, it will have been released in Sweden and Hong Kong at the Hong Kong International Film Festival. But it's been a really slow rollout around the world, starting back in September 2013 when it first played at the Donostia San Sebastian International Film Festival in Spain. So it's been really taking its time. Oh, that's really sad. And no release dates in the U.S. listed yet. Wow. All Here's right. hoping. Here's hoping. So watch the watch the trailer, everybody, and then call Harvey. I'm sure his personal number is listed on the internet somewhere. <laughs> I think it's at the end of the trailer. That's right. And tell him you want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my trailer, you will be get uh, be able to see. Uh, it it brings Andy the mysterious Ben Kingsley in touch with his afterlife, and that afterlife is Ryan Reynolds in director Tarsem Singh's new film Self Slash Less. Uh, the story is pretty straightforward. Ben is old, he's dying of cancer, but he's rich. And because money can't buy happiness, he puts it toward a new body instead so that he can live forever and ever. Amen. That new body is Ryan Reynolds. So it's a body switching thing and there's memory lapsing and people are sad and then they get mad and then they get even and the wah da do da So I like me some Kingsley, you know I do, uh, when I can get it. And I've been told that I bear a hunky resemblance to Ryan Reynolds. So, uh, as you well know, I'm on the record on this very show. Uh, but this film might just be too much face off, face slash off for me to be really fantastic. And that's a tough comparison to shake in my mind. I don't know what to make of it. Still, Singh's uh, most recent film was Mirror Mirror with Julia Roberts and uh, Lily Collins, which I thought was a lot of fun. And it boasted some terrific visuals in an otherwise charming family romp. Uh, before that, he helmed uh, The Cell, that creepy uh, Jenny from the Block, Vince Vaughn, and Vincent D'Onofrio, who is fantastic, crime thriller. Uh, that was pretty disturbing. It was pretty disturbing. And then The Immortals, which was uh, Henry Cavill's uh, uh, romp, as a uh, shirtless romp, I should say, as Theseus, uh, frankly, which I remember more because of Hyperion's cool energy bow, which they stole directly from the animated Dungeons & Dragons cartoon that I grew up with. Here, here. Uh, with the uh, that sort of visual like pedigree behind him, I'm going to give uh, Tarsum, Ben, and Ryan, my soul brother, a uh, the benefit of the doubt pass, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to give Self Slash Less a chance when it hits. Uh, what do you think? Have you seen Seconds? No, is that another one? That's because you brought this up um, last week or the week before, you, or you briefly mentioned it. Maybe I can't remember, or somebody brought it up during our our uh, film board or something, the new Ryan Reynolds film. I, and I couldn't remember what the story was what, that it sounded like, but it sounds like Seconds. And we're going to be talking about Seconds um, in one of our series coming up um, in in June, I think. And, Wait, are you talking, uh, you're talking about the uh, Frankenheimer Seconds, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, you're right. It's That's what it totally reminds me of, more than Face Off. It's the exact same story. And I had heard that Seconds was getting remade. I mean, this was a while back. And I was like, well, that's interesting. I wonder who's going to do it and how it's going to turn out. And then all of a sudden it disappeared. And and I'm just wondering if this is the version of Seconds that uh, ended up getting made. Because it, it, looks, be. it looks like it's on the same path, but at the same time, it looks like they also take it into totally different territory. Yeah, it looks. it, it really looks strikingly similar. Um, you know, there's the health angle. It's not just I'm I'm in my midlife crisis, miserable. Right. Um, still, I, you got to admit when you see this thing, there's a, there's just that that whole sort of visual, the tone, the the visual language is very face offy. Well, that's what that's, made me think of it. That's the thing with Tarsum is is his films are generally very. Uh, interesting to look at. I I don't know if I can say I've enjoyed any of them. <laughs> I haven't I haven't seen the fall, and I hear that's the one to watch. So I need to check that one out. But I You're haven't. You saying enjoyed... you didn't you didn't like Mirror Mirror? That was fun. I, that was one of the most painful movie going experiences. Oh I've... <laughs> goodness! I hated it. Wow. Uh, you know the problem with that one is it came out right around uh, when uh, uh, Snow White and the Huntsman. That's not the problem with that. <laughs> Well, I I uh, agree to disagree. I I like that one. So, okay, there. Yeah, you I'll... can have that. I'll have Snow White and the Huntsman. <laughs> I want that one too. Okay, uh... you can have both of those. I'll have Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I'll go back to the <laughs> Disney classic. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! All right. Well, this one uh, comes out in July sometime. Like July tenth, I think is when I. I, I've already closed the one. Yes, July 10th, 2015. So um, I'm going to go see it. And I'm going to tell you 
what it's like. The uh, the artwork is great. I love the movie poster. It's really cool. So excellent. There you go, Andy. Yes, you're a caveman. I mean, I like you to like me, but there's a limit. You know, nobody ever looked at me like that. Not even when I was young. Yes, when we're young, we have dreams that never pan out. But we go on dreaming. Why are you looking at me? Is my face dirty? It's beautiful. Since I'm old enough to be your father, I... You're not so old. You don't think so? Well, you're not a boy. You're just, uh, mature. I like mature people. Why don't you paint my picture? I'd like to. Johnny, don't talk like that. Well, it's the truth. I'm fed up with you. Johnny! That's the only thing you ever understood. I'm through with it. You lied to me, Kitty. It was him, wasn't it? Why'd you come here? To ask you to marry me. What about your wife? I haven't any wife. That's finished. For cat's sake, you... My husband turned up. I'm free. <laughs> don't cry, Kitty. Please don't cry. <laughs> I'm not crying, you fool. I'm laughing. Kitty. <laughs> oh, you idiot. How can a man be so dumb? Kitty. Andy, we're doing Scarlet Street. Yes, we are. Uh, 1945 is a Fritz Lang film uh, based on the uh, based on the book by Georges de la Fouchardière. Wow. And uh, and André Muezion. And uh, there you go. And, that, and, and 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 also the film. And Dudley Nichols. Well, Dud- Dudley Nichols. <laughs> And and the you're talking about uh, La Chienne, right? 1931, right. Uh, Jean Renoir. Right. And uh, yes, so that's what we're talking about, Scarlet Street. Fritz Lang's yes, take indeed. on all of those other films and books and stories. What did uh, what did you think? I love it. Do you do you love it? I knew you, I know you love it. I knew you were going <laughs> to love it. And I know that love I'm runs always- so deep. I, I'm always nervous when you say that because then I'm like, he's either saying that because he does too or because he really hated it. <laughs> <laughs> well, after watching it again, what do you what do you think I'm going to say? I'd like to think that you're going to say that you loved it too. I'm going to say that. Oh, good. I do. I deeply love it. I, I had a, a wonderful time watching this film. And um, my the the big question that I have for you is, is the overriding theme of this film guilt or jealousy hmm jealousy you just, you just let that you just let that sit that's my okay. that's my th- that's what i keep thinking about with this film is, is is it is this about is this a film about um you know catholic guilt or horrendous jealousy well tell me about your jealousy theory cuz you I'm think it's guilt cuz you're landing on guilt uh, I don't know if I'm landing on guilt uh, either. Well, first of all, you got to talk about what the movie's about. Can you uh, g- give people a, just a brief uh, uh, summary? Uh, sure. There is uh, Ed- Edward G. Robinson plays Chris Cross, which uh, I'd like to say that there is more meaning to that name in this film, but there really isn't. It just happens to be his name, Christopher Cross. Um, he is a just a complete... Uh, pushover of a man who is a cashier. Between the moon and New York City. What's that? It's crazy, but it's true. What? What's that? Did you just say what's that? What are you singing? When you get stuck between the moon and New York City by Christopher Cross. <laughs> I was trying to give you a little background, uh, appropriate background music. Oh, forget it. Go on. <sighs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. I uh, I had completely forgotten that there was a another Christopher Cross out there. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. Until you gave me that, it's it's actually uh, called uh, Arthur's theme. Yes, that's right. Yeah, another cinematic tie-in. <laughs> Maybe Fritz Lang was. <laughs> yeah, you know had that I, story in mind when he told this story. Yeah, must must credit Burt Bacharach, the great Burt Bacharach, and uh, Carol Bear Sager and Peter Allen, in addition to Chris Cross. Christopher go. Cross. He never goes. By. Go. Would you go on? Uh, yes, please. Uh, so he's a cashier. He's just a very pushover um, kind of guy. 
he who married his landlady whose husband had died and uh it's just a terrible marriage that he's in he ends up saving a uh a, well quote unquote saving a young girl from a mean thug one night and uh, kind of falls head over heels for this young woman even though it turns out she is with this guy who was uh was kind of pushing her around and uh, it's it's you know she might be a prostitute he might be his uh her pimp it's kind of hard to tell but it, or it might just be kind of a very kind of a dirty relationship but whatever it is he falls for this girl chris falls for this girl and she thinks that he's this uh very rich painter because that's his hobby is painting and basically she and her uh her boyfriend slash pimp set up this plan to kind of start taking money getting him to kind of give them money to uh to get a new apartment and all this stuff and so he doesn't really have any money he's embezzling money you know, he falls for the femme fatale. He goes down a very dark path and ends up in a very dark place. That's yeah, the long and the short of it. That about does it. All right. So yeah. here's the thing. There, he's an older man. He's, he's um, you know, older middle age, would you say? What would oh, you guess? Yeah. yeah, I definitely would say 50, he's... He's 50, 50s. Oh, yeah. All right. At the very beginning, he's talking to one of his colleagues uh, at his place of work as they finish an, an evening they're standing out on the street and he sees uh, the young woman and he says in this really kind of sincerely longing way not like a not like a you know pervert but he says i wonder what it's like what chris to be loved by a young girl like that you know nobody ever looked at me like that not even when i was young Right, and that to me sets the tone for the entire film. Right, that sets the tone for this guy, who is married to uh, a, a woman who's on her second uh, marriage, and she's horrible. Uh, and he's in a job that he's good at, but is uninspired. And he discovers there is this alternative scenario in which he can be a hero. To this to this young woman and he it becomes a codependent kind of relationship where he you know his satisfaction his his level of okay is uh, is only okay when she is okay that's why he has to start stealing money from his office he has to start you know uh, doing things that he would normally not do in order to make her life okay because he is now uh, connected to her and I think that as the as the story unfolds, uh, we end up seeing uh, more and more of a tale of jealousy, um, uh, uh, this morality tale of jealousy, right? Of of what happens when you uh, when you let jealousy kind of run your your life, uh, and I find that fascinating. And I say guilt versus jealousy because the first time I saw this film, I thought it was all about it was all an allegory. It was all about him feeling just horrible for the things that he had done. Uh, but I've totally changed my tune. Well, I and I agree with you, and it's actually I, I I don't know if I was in my head uh, feeling like jealousy was the right word, but I think the way that you're selling it makes does make sense to me because I, I think for me the thing that really highlights it is uh, you get to the end of the film and you see that okay I, well just to tell fill people in on the end of the film yeah. so so Chris he discovers that Kitty uh, this girl. And uh, and her uh, pimp uh, boyfriend Johnny are actually together, and he comes back when she's alone and uh, tries to kind of get her to come back to him. And she's, you know, we think that, or he thinks that she's crying in her pillow, but really she's laughing at, at just how old and disgusting he is and how much she hates him and and everything. And he takes an ice pick and kills her. And then he he flees, and Johnny ends up coming back, and then everybody thinks Johnny did it. Johnny gets uh, executed, and uh, meanwhile, his paintings, because of this you know strange twist in the story, are attributed to her. Um, and he's meanwhile caught uh, having embezzled a bunch of funds from the company, and so he he's now a street bum, right? He's living on the street, and he is haunted. Now, this is an interesting way because – and the reason that it feels like it's guilt is because it seems like her spirit is essentially kind of haunting him. 
and with you know making him feel guilty for having taken her life and uh cuz i mean he his life is ruined and he ends up just a bum and he sees his one of his paintings getting sold for you know a, a cheap painting basically getting sold for $10,000 and here he is just living on the streets, and he's got this voice of hers, uh, you know, Jeepers, I love you, Johnny. Jeepers, I love you, Johnny. Just hauntingly echoing as he wanders aimlessly through the streets. And the first time I saw it, in fact, most of the times I've seen it, I have read that as kind of guilt like you have. But what it really comes across as is he's not guilty about the fact that he killed her. Well, the voice that's coming in his head is not necessarily saying, why would you do this to me? Why would you kill me, Chris? It's not a guilt-ridden conscience that he has. It's the fact that all he can think of is how she loved Johnny. And that's what's driving his, him mad. Not the fact that, uh, you know, w- w- what he wanted was that she would love him. But he's just jealous that, you know, basically she's gone to her grave and now is haunting him with the fact that she's always loved Johnny. Well, and that's the rub, right? Because and, and this is why it's not a guilt thing, because he doesn't feel guilt and he's not haunted, uh, even to the point where he's on the, the, uh, he's on the witness stand perjuring himself uh, during the trial of Johnny. Because the mistaken identity around the whole end of the film is that, you know, Johnny's fingerprints are on the ice pick because he picked it up after, uh, after Chris had dropped it. He picked it up at the murder scene and his prints are all over. He's arrested. He says, it wasn't me. It wasn't me, Johnny says. But they also happen to have, um, you know, they know that um, from the phone call, she's she was on the phone and she heard with her uh, a former roommate and heard her say, oh, hang on, I've got to go. Johnny's here. But it wasn't Johnny. It was Chris coming in about to murder her. But that's OK, because they have a witness that now that says she was on the phone and she saw it was Johnny. So he's going to to he's going to the to the uh, to be electrocuted and chris perjures himself he lies on the stand if he is really that guilty uh, about this whole thing if he's really going to be haunted about guilt then why is he able to muster the the energy to lie on the stand and that's what i think is so interesting that the real haunting starts once johnny is dead and the voices come not only from um you know from jeepers i love you from her but also from johnny lazy legs what's that lazy legs you know she's and and she is now and they are now reunited in death and it's like that's the thing that pushes him over the edge and that's something i didn't catch the first time uh, I, I watched this film, I thought it was really fascinating. It is. It is. It's, it's a very uh, nice twist to this story, and it actually um, it's interesting because I mean, in this series, we've talked a bit about the Hayes Code and just the way that they were policing films. This film had a lot of issues uh, that the Hayes Code found, or I'm sorry, the Hayes Code found a lot of issues with this film. I said that backwards. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> that was good, though. I liked it. I just like the way you put it. I like your style. <laughs> this is right. <laughs> but they, um, they really had to. Um, uh, well, in the script process, there was a few things that they had to trim down a little bit. A lot of it was um, uh, was it was not done though until after the film was shot, and uh, the producer Walter Wanger. And uh, and Universal, who was releasing it, was going to distribute the film. They worked with the Hayes Code, and they were going to cut just only a few minutes. I, I think it was just a couple minutes out of the film of things that uh, they felt um, needed to be trimmed. Like, I think initially, um, Chris stabs her seven times with the ice pick, and they cut that back to about four times or so, um, which, as if that's, you know, changes the morality of, of stabbing someone. Yeah, right, right. But... Um, I guess it's just less. It, it's a little, you know, it's a little easier to tolerate when you don't have to watch it for quite as long. I guess right, maybe. Right. But but anyway, they um, they brought up this issue with the ending. That was a major issue that they had was that they they felt that he doesn't get punished. He doesn't go to jail. Luckily, Walter Wanger. Well, it sounds like he was a very uh, sharp cookie, 
And he really worked with these guys and got them to change uh, or got them to agree that, you know what, he is getting punished. And Fritz Lang, too. He talked to him, you know, he's getting punished. He's getting punished in, you know, in his, with his guilt. His conscience is punishing him. And Walter Wanger was able to really sell that and they bought into it and everything. But there were some other uh, little tweaks that they had to change. And Fritz, it, it ended up creating quite a bit of tension between uh, Fritz Lang and Walter Wanger. Um, they were in their own little distribu or their own little production company called uh, Diana uh, Pictures that uh, produced this film, and it was I think like maybe the only film that they ended up producing because it was just such a, a, a it created such tension between these two because of the control that Fritz thought he was losing in this process, even though they hardly changed anything. But the interesting thing that uh, that people have since brought up is there was so much focus on the fact that Chris ends up getting off scot-free and doesn't get punished. <laughs> no one has nobody... any thought about Johnny. Is that where yeah, you're going? Nobody, yeah, exactly. <laughs> nobody said anything about the fact that they end up executing an innocent man. And I love yes, it. John, Johnny's a horrible character. Nobody likes him. So we're all kind of happy to see him go. But it's like, but nobody brought that up. And it's very interesting that uh, it kind of got looked over. It is. It's fascinating because you really are. It, it feels like, I mean, the guy's a mis misogynist and a cheat. He's horrible. He's a liar. He's a terrible person. And he, in, you know, he becomes the story of redemption in this whole thing because he's the only silver lining. Everybody else, she dies. Uh, Chris ends up a bum on the street, uh, you know, essentially nameless because his, his art has been taken from him, which is uh, the, the ultimate kind of um, uh, theft in this thing. Just that his name was stolen, uh, and and Johnny killed for a crime he didn't commit, based on a foundation, a legal foundation of lies from people that he used to consort with. Nobody bats an eye, and yet that's something as an audience member that becomes the highlight of the end of the film. Right, that's the redemption story. It, it is. It really is. It's 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 nice to see him go because. You just you just really hate him so much, but it is it's interesting that at, in this time when the Hayes Code was so uh, strict as to what they'd let by that they just missed it. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, so that is um, that's the fascinating story of the Hayes Code. It shows how stupid the Hayes Code was, really. Just yeah, and, really, really dumb. And the MPAA, you know, has many of its own problems that it still is dealing with and i i think that there's a there's a place for ratings and there's a reason for ratings but i just don't think they have found a system that is really doing what it's supposed to do yeah clearly okay uh so talking about the film again edward g robinson so here's the edward g robinson is uh fantastic in this film um and he is fantastic as the dullard, and I don't give him enough credit in my in my mental sort of alchemy of his performances. Mm -hmm. I don't give him enough credit for being uh, a softy because the the roles that I note him that I I think of him the iconic roles they're the roles where he's he's kind of the hard ass. Yeah, and he's I, I so mean, good. He's so good in this film as the gentle dullard. Uh, who who is struggling with that thing that I I have talked about a, a lot in the past, which is this idea of of a man in a position to feel like he has lost his so much of his power, um, in and you know his power just in in terms of his you know the relationships that he has uh, he is, um, and and this is an example of him uh, of a man playing that role perfectly. It's the Walter Mitty uh, that that I think he just nails and. When you add that noir twist of making him, you know, of this crime of passion at the end, I think he just, he is just transcendent in this film. He's, he's, uh, yeah, he's brilliant. And there's something to his nebbishness that works really well with this strange um, kind of change that they have in his character. He's so um, sexually repressed in the film. And uh, a, a lot of that comes from his relationship with his wife, who, I mean, we see their home life. Chris is the one who wears the apron and does the dishes, and he's completely emasculated in his life. And there's a strange, uh, almost a strange, uh, I won't say transformation, but there's this, it's just this extended emasculation, I guess I'll call it, of, of how Chris just constantly is being left, um, left cold, really. 
He's, um, you know, the, these, the scenes with the apron are great. The way that his wife treats him are great. There's a fantastic scene when his wife confronts him with, with the name of Kitty uh, because she's seen the art now in the galleries. And he's holding that knife. And the way he kind of approaches her with that knife is in one uh, hand, on the one hand, it's, it's kind of like this threatening uh, position that he has as he kind of is holding the knife and moving toward her. On the other hand, it's almost like this sexual approach, like, you know, that's uh, his phallic symbol and he's going toward her. And then as his wife leaves, he kind of lowers his hand and he drops the knife into the floor. It's like he loses all, like he's completely flaccid and he's just, he's, you know, completely, his wife has taken everything out of him again, you yeah. know? Which ends up being an interesting, does. Too, totally. And it ends up being an interesting sort of uh, visual foreshadow to the way he, uh, he when he ultimately sort of remasculates himself and and ends up you know killing kitty he does so by repeatedly thrusting this ice pick into her and that's that that ends up being a really um just sort of sexually charged uh violence uh it's, and it's the only it's the only way he's ever able to actually take kitty right you right. know he's wanted to so badly but he never gets to and this is the only way he finally does yeah and then and then conversely kitty is uh is masculated to a certain extent because Johnny tricks these art uh, critics into thinking that she's the one who did the paintings and they keep marveling at the fact that, wow, I could have sworn that the, the, the paintings had been done by a man. I'm so good at being able to tell. And so she has to kind of play it off like, yeah, they're her paintings and they just find her such a masculine painter. And it's it's an interesting kind of uh, switch there between the two of them. It's an interesting crisscross, if you will. Well played, <laughs> man. <laughs> oh, that was good. Oh, man. I don't know. It was good or cheesy. But, <laughs> but there it was. Just let it hang. Just That's let right. it hang. <laughs> uh yeah that's actually a really good point and and uh, i hadn't i i hadn't made that connection quite so much but you're right they make they they make so many references to their shock and awe that these paintings were painted by um that that they they might have been painted by a man that uh, uh boy they're they're not shy about driving that point home oh and the other bit about about him being completely emasculated yeah. when he's when he's talking to his wife about um, I, and I can't remember if it's in, also in that kitty conversation, but he's just like she says something about uh, you know uh, seeing naked women. He's like, oh oh honey, I've never seen a naked woman. <laughs> well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> like what kind of marriage do they have? Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. The uh you know there there are these little moments, these little sequences that sort of continue that uh, to cement that his position in in their relationship which is wonderful. Like for example, uh as they as as they you know he, she walks into his house and he's uh he's introducing the painting of her former husband who was killed uh, by you know being a hero and the painting is up on the wall and it actually has his real medal of honor like not a painted version of it, but the real Medal of Honor is is stuck into the painting, uh, just to just to showcase kind of look at look at just how small you are in my house. I'm going to put a giant painting of my former husband above our couch in our main living area, so that not only are you reminded every day about how small you are next to this, uh, but everyone that comes into our circle is going to be reminded, which I just love. And then they're eating, he's eating dinner alone. He is eating dinner alone at the kitchen table, and she is harping on him to finish eating dinner and go do the dishes. Uh, it, it is just like, it, it's just a wonderful, wonderful um, and horrible relationship. It really is. Uh, you know, pretty much everybody in this film is horrible. Uh, you know, and, and really by choice, largely. I mean, yeah. he's, he's he makes really bad decisions, but they're all choices that he makes as he goes down this path. Uh, his boss, I mean, his boss really kind of sets the stage for this whole thing because right from the beginning of the film, it's it's uh, Chris's 25th um, anniversary of the, with the company party. Everybody's celebrating, and his boss has to run out because he's got to go out with his mistress. So that kind of sets yeah. the stage for, for Chris to start pining for these younger women. Uh, obviously, Kitty and Johnny are bad. His wife is terrible. His wife's, uh, you know, 
husband who we all think is dead is terrible like everybody is is just a terrible character i can't it's very figure out i can't figure out their relationship the or his uh the the husband's motivation it's not terribly clear what they're they're it's like they're trying to bribe each other uh but but they're both trying to bribe each other for the same thing well no the the husband uh, or the the former husband wants to pretend wants to go on basically pretending that he's dead and he wants money from chris in in order to pretend that he's dead in order to continue pretending that he's dead because he thinks that chris has a happy marriage with with the wife with right. adele right right and and so and he's kind of threatening hey you better give me some money or i'm going to tell adele that i'm alive and, and kind of threatening like to ruin their marriage by showing up showing up again and kind of ruining his marriage and that's where chris actually has the upper hand because he doesn't you know the husband yeah, he doesn't wants, realize yeah he wants out too <laughs> chris wants out but right but so what's, chris what's so itch, i mean that i don't you find that sequence that exchange between them a little bit convoluted am i i it's, mean I, am it's, I alone? it's convoluted it, it, that's that's the one thing in the film that's always been a little problematic to me it's 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 such a a uh, strange scene that feels so forced in order to just allow chris to be uh, you know, in a position where he can be free. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. I, at least I'm feeling like I'm not completely off my rocker. I mean, I do like, I do like, again, like I said, that this character is just as bad as everybody else. He's the scam artist who really just wants money from Chris. And, uh, you and, know, I think that's an interesting way to play that character. Right. And it ends up being an interesting resolution because Chris ends up, again, not playing the hero. He ends up, you know, tricking this guy and tricks him into his home in the dead of night and tricks him into the bedroom where his wife is sleeping uh, by telling him, no, she's not home. You just got to be quiet because of the neighbors and tricks him into the room where he wakes the wife and, and they, you know, and there's a big screaming fit as Chris sneaks out the door, right? Like, yep. like, like an animal, like a savage sneaking <laughs> into the night. Like, like a caveman. Right. Again, just another, so you, you like every, every time you find yourself really feeling for Chris, he does things that are just still not good. There is nobody good in this film. No, they're not. Okay. They are not. Uh, let's talk then about uh, the good Joan Bennett. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, we ha she hasn't popped up on our radar before, but uh, she's really fantastic in this. Um, she is actually one of the owners of this production company, Diana uh, Pictures, that was working with Fritz Lang. Fritz Fritz had a lot of uh, problems in Hollywood. He was a very argumentative director and didn't like working with his producers, and so you know, I think he got kicked out of MGM and all this stuff. And Bennett really, uh, she had worked with him uh, with on a couple films. I think uh, the Woman in the Window before Scarlet Street, and really liked working with Fritz. So she convinced her husband Walter Wanger to start this production company with him, uh, where Fritz would be uh, the largest shareholder and wouldn't feel put upon by a producer. And, uh, and they turned out a great film in this. Um, so. You know, I, I think that Joan is a is a savvy businesswoman. I think that she kind of um, knew what she was doing. This was at a point in her career, she had uh, stepped out for a little bit uh, to have kids, and was trying to get back into the swing of things. And uh, you know, she it's you know Hollywood. She's at that age. I think at the time, uh, let's see, she was born in 1910, so she was 35 years old, and she was afraid that people thought she was already you know kind of past her prime. And uh, luckily, she wasn't. And they um, and, and Fritz uh, put her in this film and it proved that you know she's not too old. She's uh, perfect in in this sort of film or anything else. She was wonderful. And I mean, she's an actress who had been acting since she was six years old back in the silent era, and uh, just kind of really carried that through for decades. And then I mean, she was on uh, Dark Shadows for um in the 60s and she was in suspiria that was her final movie role and she just had acted for a very long time she ended up uh having a heart attack in 1990 but uh she had a long and lustrous career she's terrific in this film as the um as uh the the femme fatale uh she is uh underhanded two-faced just horrible and everything that she should be in a film like this. Absolutely. It's just horrible. 
she she's and it's interesting because she's not she's not a very um active femme fatale but she's definitely more of kind of a psychological femme fatale right right it's the it's the uh what does she hang her hat on it's the lies of omission uh, yes, but but it makes her, and it's interesting that when you look at the the source material, you know that the the you know the the thirty one film of uh, based on this material, La Chienne, was you know loosely translated to the bitch, right? This film is centered on her character and and the sort of dubious nature of of her morality, um, right? And right. Uh, and I, I think that says it you know well enough. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we have talked about her before. She was in uh, We're No Angels. Oh, that's right. She, she was the she was the mother. Yeah, I'll be darned. Mm-hmm. Well, I just maybe I didn't connect right away because she was so maternal. She in was that so film. maternal, right? She was so good. <laughs> so evil in this film. <laughs> oh man, uh, Dan Derea. Dan Derea. Uh You know, it's funny. I I was reading about him. And he is an actor who um, he became notorious for being the kind of like the slapper, like the guy who would beat up the women. And that, uh, I mean, he did a, a wide variety of films, but that was the thing that uh, people uh, you know knew him for. And it's not like he was that type of guy in real life, but I guess he really drew his his fans because of how how abusive he was to his female characters in films, which is the strangest thing. But like women would come up and get their autograph, get his autograph uh, uh, because they loved how much he hit women. That's not film. good. That's I, not good. It's so strange. It really is strange, but yeah, wow. but he's great. And I, I, I hear, I, I don't know. I'm sure I, I I've, he's had a pretty lengthy career. I probably have seen him in something and just have not realized it, but He's um, uh, from what I've read. He very much was kind of a great actor portraying this type of character. Did you see him in uh, 1949's Criss Cross? <laughs> I knew with, he was with in it. Burt Lancaster and Yvonne Actually, DiCarlo. I have seen Criss Cross, but it's been so long. I I couldn't tell you even uh, what it's about, but I, I know I saw it ages ago. He gets to kill Burt Lancaster in that movie. Oh, well, there you go. Not many people get to say that. <laughs> um, all right. I he was. I thought he was. Uh, you know. He. What are you going to say about a guy like that? You're right. He is a slapper, and he slaps. You know. If you if you're going to be celebrating the quality of a slap, he's he's he does it well. Uh, he has a. He's, it's uncomfortable to watch him in this film because he is. He really is. Uh, you know. Just horrible this is the one of the things that really dates the film it's just the casual misogyny then and, and he sort of um uh, well it, it's actually not quite so casual because he has to be the contrast to chris cross's um you know uh, attempted gentleness right but part of that is also why i feel like this is actually a pimp and prostitute relationship more so yes. than just a sleazy uh, you know boyfriend girlfriend like you know from the low end of things it really feels like a like he acts like a pimp toward her he's always taking he's always checking all of her little secret stashes for any uh, any spots she could have hidden some money you know he's always taking all of her money um he kind of acts like he loves her but not really and she seems to be always pining for him but uh and he calls her lazy legs like it's like her job is to spread her legs for people, but she's lazy about it and just never is making much money for him, even though he kind of, you know, he kind of likes her and so he kind of keeps her around. And the way he dresses, I mean, this is definitely an over the top style of dress, uh, even for the time. I mean, nobody was walking around like this, but he's, he's, he's very flashy and showy. And it's just like everything about him screams pimp to me. I totally agree, and I think that's that is a, a really interesting thing, and it makes her character so much more interesting too, um, and pitiable. Right? She is uh, she is someone that now, when you look at it in the context of her being a, a prostitute to him, um, the way that she uh, you, you know sort of fawns over him and does everything that that he asks her to do, um, you know, it really makes you realize just how pitiful she is. Um, that that she is as lost as as everyone else in this uh, film. Yeah. So yeah, maybe yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at it. 
Well, thank you. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of you to say. <laughs> Should we talk about uh, Fritz? Good old Fritz Lang. Fritz Lang. This is one of his Hollywood films. This, uh, I think he said this is his favorite film that he made in the U.S. Yes. Yes. I would agree with that. Would and you, then I, I would think you he, agree I think that he, it is uh, that it should be his favorite? Uh, should, have you seen all of favorite? his? Have you seen all of his? Uh, uh, I all have, of his films. I have not. In fact, I have seen very few of his films, unfortunately. And I, he's a director that I really want to kind of um, you know jump on that filmography and really try to tackle a lot more of it. Um, I've seen, I think. A lot more. Well, I shouldn't say a lot, but I, you know, more of his uh, films that he made in Europe, like Metropolis, M. Um, yeah, maybe that's it. Um, Spies, the the uh, Instagram stumper from uh, from before. That's, that's right. one of his. That's right. And uh, uh, what else have I seen of his? I am very light on my. Uh, yeah, looking through his filmography, I think that's it. Uh, I think we, those in Scarlet Street. So yeah, I don't. I don't have. Uh, I don't even have those. I've got Metropolis, um, and that's that is literally it. And Scarlet Street. Um, so I, I feel like it's hard because I know there is a conversation in here about the German influence on you know on filmmaking style here. Mm-hmm. I know there's a conversation there. I don't feel equipped to have it. Yeah, it's uh, I mean it's definitely there. I mean he you know he he kind of came from that German filmmaking. In fact, he ended up fleeing Germany. I, I, he had I, I I it sounds like he had an interesting conversation uh with uh it was, I think it was with uh, Goebbels right around the time when um um uh, you know the war was getting ready to be uh taking off and everything and they wanted him to kind of be one of the filmmakers for the Reich. And he was like, Oh, that sounds great. And he was all, you know, acting like he was really into it and everything. And as soon as uh, they left, he was like, he had to flee the country. And his, his wife at the time, uh, Thea von Harbo, I think was her name, um, stayed and she ended up working with the Reich. She divorced him and everything, um, because he fled the country and didn't want to be working in that situation. And so, um, smart on his part, smart on his part. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's what ended his uh, relationship with with Thea von Harbo, who had been in uh, a very important collaborator for him on some of those earlier films that he was making over there. Um, so, but yeah, he was a very uh, like I said, he was a very argumentative fellow, and um, some people say that his best films were the ones that he had intense. Um, uh, intensely poor relationships with the other producers that he was working with because that brought out the best in him to make great films. And when he was um, in a happier situation, then his uh, he wasn't the films didn't end up as good. Again, I haven't seen enough of them to really be able to say that, but I you know I find it interesting. And uh, you know he does seem like a director who really knew what he wanted and just um, just didn't seem like he really had the right way of going about getting it. Uh, the film, uh, the cinematography of the film was uh, by the uh, great Milton Krasner. Mm-hmm. 162 credits on Mil- old Milt Krasner. Just a few. Just a, just a few. Uh, what stands out to you in, in terms of the filmmaking style? It's it has a great noir look. A lot of uh, a lot of darkness, a lot of grays, a lot of murkiness that we see. Um, they just, they do a good job of playing with the uh, the dark and the light. I think it's it's great how it, when Chris actually finally murders her, it's actually a fairly bright scene. Her bed is kind of the big it's like white, white silk. White, yeah, yeah, it's like all white silk, and she's in this white uh, white uh, nightgown, and it just it it balances all of that really nicely. I think that the, the darks and the lights work really well to create a noirish vibe all through the film. I do too. Uh, again, uh, uh, plays with light and uh, wet well. I think the opening sequence in the rain is uh, is really nicely done and and um, uh, really good use of playing with reflections and shadows uh, during the rescue scene. I think it's uh, it's uh, uh, an interesting thing to look at. Um, uh, generally, the uh, you know I think the use of of space in you know the interiors are it, it, it's always fun for me to 
to be in the perspective of the camera while playing with in, in her new apartment, which I thought was a really interesting space, the new painting uh, painting area and those stairs and kind of the glass doors. I think it made for um, an interesting sense of compression uh, and, and intensity when you know that the characters are doing their sort of threes company kind of, you know, oh my gosh, Jack's in the bedroom with a bra. And, and you know, it was that sort of <laughs> feeling like, oh, got to get Johnny out of there. And, and, right. um, uh, so I I really enjoyed um, enjoyed the way the camera moved, um, and uh, and I agree with you the lights and darks so, uh, you know he played well with that and it made the uh, what was really nice about that is made the blood the spots of blood that we did see um, you know really really stand out. Uh, there's also so. there's also a great shot when really kind of the the, uh, the finale for Chris so to speak when he goes back to work. And we see him, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember uh, exactly where this is, but it's right toward the end. Um, He's in his little cashier glass cage, really, is kind of what it's like. And he sees some police officers being taken up to his boss, JJ's office. And he's going to try to sneak out, but then JJ calls him up to the office. And there's this great shot as he's brought up to the office, which is up some stairs. But even from that point, the camera is much higher, like way looking down on him as he kind of, you know, it's almost like the, the dead man's walk going up the stairs up to JJ's office to uh, to face the executioner of his own, really. And it's, it's really in a film that... Um, is so emasculating of him, it really makes him much more of a diminutive figure at this point. And we're so much uh, farther above him that it just feels like, you know, we're, (laughs) we are kind of the executioner looking down on him, ready to judge him ourselves. Well, and isn't that a wonderful transition too visually, because every other time we see him at work, he's in this cage and that cage is his sort of metaphorical protection from everything that, you know, from discovery, even though it's glass, he is, he is in it. He is protected from the outside world. And so this, you know, I think you're right when that cage is broken, when he has to come out of it, it, they do such a wonderful job of opening that world um, to make him feel so small. I think that's a really, really good point. There's also another uh, a great editing cut in there, um, and I can't remember if it's right around the same part or if it might be a little earlier, when we see the painting that he painted of Kitty that's titled Self-Portrait, interestingly enough, um, behind the glass in the gallery. And it's like that represents uh, you know everything that she's become. She's just this, this lifeless um, thing behind glass that he can't have, really. And then it cuts to him behind his own glass in the cashier's office, where it's like you know he really is almost like you know this this lifeless thing that's just you know stuck inside something that can't get out. Right. It's a uh, it's just nicely done the way that Lang very smartly put this film together, both in constructing each shot and then how to cut them together, working with his editor. Uh, anyone else you want to talk about specifically? Um. I think that uh, that's mostly it, although Hans uh, Salter did the music, and I think the music works really well in this film. Um, he did a lot of a lot of films, and uh, I think that uh, this is just he, – he has a great feel for the tone of this uh, film and for the genre. Did a great job. He did a lot of music in the, uh, like the different uh, universal um, horror films and stuff like that, and uh, um, yeah, I think his music works uh, perfectly in context of the film. I um that's I'm glad you brought it up. I I I have no memory of the music right now. For some reason the music did not make an impression on me in this film. Is that strange? Well, it, I don't know if it's strange. It's not a score that I think I would pull up and listen to uh regularly, but when you're watching the film, I think it works really well to help with the the mood and the tone of the film. I need to watch. I'm going to watch a little bit of it again tonight. There you I, go. I feel like I've done it a disservice now. Can't even think about it. Couldn't even place it. <laughs> I'm horrible. Anybody else? The last person I wanted to talk about was uh, was John Decker, who is uh, probably not a name that you would pull from the credits readily, but he is the actual artist who actually did all of uh, all of Chris Cross's paintings. 
And uh, he was also a quite famous painter in his own right. And his oh, paintings yes. hang in the uh, Louvre and I'm sure in some museum that begins with National. Am I right? <laughs> he has paintings all over the place. Um, he was. <laughs> I'm making uh, that up for the most part. I can't confirm well, or deny personally. I, I, yeah, I don't know where his uh, paintings hang. But he painted a lot of people in Hollywood. He was uh, friends with a lot of the people out there. And he created some very fun paintings that he did of of putting, like, um, famous heads uh, uh, on, like, uh, W.C. Field's head on a, on a uh, um, the head of a uh, – or on the body of a, a painting from – the middle ages of like a middle-aged woman, you know, he would do things like that where it was just like very comical, um, blendings of a famous head on somebody else's body. Um, uh, I think he did one of Harpo Marx on a, like a little boy, little boy blue painting and, um, just, but, but aside from those kind of comical ones, he did a lot of really nice just portraiture and other interesting paintings that were really nice. And I, I don't know much about John Decker, but I was just kind of poking around looking at some of his art and I was like, yeah, he actually has some pretty nice stuff that he's done. I guess there's a biography about him called Bohemian Road. The Life of Hollywood Artist John Decker. I don't know anything about the book, but I was like, hey, if people are interested in learning more about the artist, then uh, yeah, they should check that out. It is interesting. He did a he did the uh, the giant promotional painting for Swiss Family Robinson, the big twenty four sheet movie poster that that was printed. And you can I'm looking at the image of it right now on the web. It's it is definitely a crisscross painting. <laughs> he still has trouble with perspective. Interesting. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, I did like the artwork a, a lot. I found myself really drawn to it, particularly at the end when the self-portrait is being carried away to the new owner. I thought that was a really sad and dramatic way for that painting to exit the film. It really was. Yeah. It really was. And I think it uh, just the, that painting, I really love that portrait of uh, Joan Bennett in this film. I think it's it's haunting. It uh it's amazing how much of the Kitty character actually kind of comes through in that painting, but also kind of you can get a sense of his his love for her at the same time, the way that she's kind of, you know, it's almost like she's emanating a kind of a, a glow about her or something. I think right. it's pretty fascinating while lacking perspective all the same do you, time. <laughs> do you know where the uh, where the painting is? I don't know where that one is. That would be an interesting little uh, uh, hunt to figure out where that's hiding. I think so too. It was, um, yeah, I, there are some hints, there are some hints to it, uh, on the web. I don't actually, I did not actually find where it is. That's too bad. I need to catch that. Uh, how did it do? This film, uh, you know, it did okay. I guess you could say it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a, um, uh, a big splash sort of film, but it's a film that's still, it, it found its audience, and you know, I'd say people. Uh, I don't know. I, I I don't know if people uh, turned out in droves to see it or anything. But uh, although interestingly, when this film, when the people at Universal first saw this film, I think the head of Universal or something said, "This is the best film that we've ever done. This is a, such an amazing film. This is the film that you know represents Universal Studios." Like he's totally in love with it. Before, of course, the Hayes Code got involved and. <laughs> clearly uh, uh, muddled the uh, thinking on the film. But from what I found, it cost about $1.2 billion to make. Sorry, $1.2 million. <laughs> this is stunning, really expensive. <laughs> stunningly inefficient production. <laughs> uh, those paintings cost a lot wow. of money. Wow. <laughs> yeah, $1.2 million, which uh, in today's dollars is about $15.5 million. It uh, ended up grossing here in the US all I could find is the domestic um just under 3 million dollars which is about 38 million dollars so you know it made its money back but all told it uh it only uh profited well you know it's in good company it actually uh, made a little less money than the Fisher King, but a little more money than Shaun of the Dead. So there you go. <laughs> it ended up making about two hundred and two hundred nineteen thousand four hundred dollars per finished minute. Well, it's not bad. No, I think it's pretty good. I say we rank it. Let's do it. 
Head over to Flickchart, everybody. Flickchart.com slash the next reel, and you can uh, you can check out our list of top films. Geely is not at the top. Hopefully that <laughs> has been rectified. Uh, and uh, friend us up there, and let's see if our uh, film, favorite films line up with your favorite films uh, as we uh, stack rank uh, 1945's Scarlet Street. I think this one might do. Uh, I think it might do okay. I think it's going to do pretty well. It's funny. The first poster that pops up for it is a Spanish poster, and it was titled Perversidad, which is perversity. Which yep, is, that, that, that'll do, Pet. That is pretty <laughs> funny. All right, so Perversidad or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Hmm. I might put Scarlet Street on before Oh Brother. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll give you that. I'll say I'll go with Scarlet Street on this one. Let's start the bidding high. That's what I say. Let's. Here you go. There you go. Scarlet Street or The Outlaw Josie Wales? I don't know. What do you think? Ah, uh, that's a tricky one. I may go Josie Wales over Scarlet Street, but I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I could go either way on this one, I think. I got to tell you, I'm leaning towards Scarlet Street. Is that crazy? It's not. It's a brilliant film. It's, it's really good. Film. I had a wonderful time watching this movie. I really did. All right. Well, I'll go with Scarlet Street. Scarlet Street. Oh, here you go, Pete. Or Fight Club. Fight Club. Yeah, I knew that would be the wall for you. <laughs> we <hit> it. <laughs> there it is. Oh, this one, I think, for me. Scarlet Street or The Thing. I think I'll go The Thing. All right. I'll give it to you. Scarlet Street or Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> We know Scarlet Street <laughs> paid more money. <laughs> um, I'll go Shaun of the Dead. I'm going to go Shaun of the Dead. Scarlet Street or The Curious Case of Benjamin Button? Hmm. We haven't had that to rank in a long time. No, we haven't. And I think I'll pick Scarlet Street over that. I will too. All right. Scarlet Street or The Hurt Locker? Wow. Um I. This is really a mood one for me. It really is. It really is. I see. I'm. I'm. I'm leaning toward uh, Scarlet Street, but I could be swayed. No, I'll do Scarlet Street with you. All right. Scarlet Street or Fargo? Hmm. I might have I to think go I'm Fargo. Gonna... Yeah, I was going to say I definitely need to go Fargo on this one. And, oh, there we are, 40 out of 178. That's a pretty good spot for That's, that, I'd say. Yeah, I think that feels really good. I agree. Yeah. I definitely agree. Well done. Where do we go from here? Well, we're going to, uh, you know, jump uh, jump back and go out of the past for our next <laughs> film. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> what year was this? Uh, out of the past. Out of the past. was... What year was out of the past? I want to say it's uh, 46, uh, but I'm wrong. It's 47. All right. Well, I look forward to it. Uh, this is going to be number four in our 2015 Film Noir series, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, I can't cool. remember it. Robert Mitchum, Kirk Douglas, Jake yeah. Greer. This is, uh, if you... Um, uh, what was the Jeff Bridges movie that they... Uh, um, remade this as Starman <laughs> <laughs> yes that's it I'm sure you're thinking of Starman that yes. is so funny that uh, said that. the only reason I say that is because I I am uh, I have no memory I, of the film and I, I told my dad all again yep. <laughs> it's all odds yes that's the remake I told my I told my dad I said I, we're doing this film noir and I said out of the past he said oh you remember that we saw that together now, I'm an only child, but I'm convinced he may have seen that with his other son. <laughs> because I just so don't remember the, so it, so you this say be fun. You, you've seen it and you don't remember, or is it possible that you haven't even seen it? It's, I'm saying I, ha, I remember it as if I've never seen it. But I am told on some marginal authority that I have seen it. <laughs> Which I, I will know. We'll know soon enough. I will see I, it next week. Yes, we will. Yeah. Excellent. I look forward to it. Uh, it it's another fantastic. Do one. you like it? Uh, do you like it better or worse than this? Where would you rank it next to Scarlet Street? Well, we'll have to wait until next week, won't we? Oh, that's a nice little teaser you just did there. <laughs>
That's right. That's right. I'm going to take that with me, and uh, I'm going to go to bed. All right. I'm going to go do some painting. mine first because it's and and i don't even know uh how to set it up i i guess i'll set it up this way it is written as a poem oh it's like a it's it's not a rhyming it's not a it's not a rhymey poem you know what they call in academics <laughs> it's a rhymey <laughs> uh, but it is written it rhymes, with, rhymes with limey and limey <laughs> it, it's uh it's a, a bit of um uh, it's a neoclassicist, I think is what they call that. Uh, it is a four-star review, a truly haunting movie. Catharsis is good for people. Everyone has some blood on their hands as they get older. This movie reaches into your guts and twists. I've seen it twice now. The first time I liked it, but didn't ever really want to see it again. This time when I watched it, I could appreciate how the master filmmaker has worked. It is said to be a remake of the French of, of the French Renoir's La Chienne. I don't know if I would want to be able to see that deeply into the human condition. And it does end on on uh, effectively on an interrobang there. Mm. So, I, I it really I, reaches into your soul. It hit me. It really hit me, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, yours. I think I think mine will uh, equally uh, hit you. Good. It's just it's a two star by Gene. Ready? Oh yeah, I was giving you a moment of uh, somber silence. Okay, here we go. Okay. Very slow moving. Oh Gene, you do know how to write them. Yeah, he really does. I love coming back to the the works of Gene. <laughs> I could Thank dip. You, I could dip into that well. <laughs> Oh, Amazon. <laughs> Andy, it is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. I love The Next Reel Season 4. Do you know why? I don't. Why? Because we got to talk about my favorite movie, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. That's not even an adaptation. Uh, no, but it was such a great part of our, of our great Terry Gilliam series. And a few others in that series were adaptations, like The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, adapted from Raspi's stories, and La Jete, which inspired 12 Monkeys. Oh, right. And, and for our Man With No Name trilogy, we saw how Sergio Leone's A Fistful of Dollars was basically stolen from Kurosawa's Yojimbo. We added Labor Day to our Jason Reitman series, adapted from Joyce Maynard's novel. Oof, there's one we'll always regret. Our big Stephen King series covered adaptations like The Shining, Cujo, Christine, and Stand By Me, Great Horror, and Coming of Age Tales. Another Coen Brothers adaptation, too. We got to talk about how they turned Homer's The Odyssey into Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? For our holiday series, we did The Bishop's Wife and The Poseidon Adventure. And who could forget seeing Alec Guinness in the adaptation of Kind Hearts and Coronets during our series dedicated to him? We really need to do more of his films. Truly. We had our first film noir series with classics like Double Indemnity, Detour, and Out of the Past. And our black and white cinematography of James Wong Howe series with The Thin Man, Sweet Smell of Success, Seconds, and King's Row. So many adaptations. Oh, you're not kidding. Dive deeper into these originals and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support our show. Get the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and start reading today. Mm-hmm. 